So today I'm here at the Fetus booth with Max. Hi Max, how's it going? I'm doing good, thank you very much. So uh, tell me about some of the products you have on display here, because you've got a lot of stuff. We try to cater to every kind of taste there is on the market. Uh, so for instance, start off with cost-effective versions of hot ends, where there's plug-and-play solutions for the Creality printers, and then the low-cost version, more universal approach with the BMS and BMO, and then the high-flow version for the Dragonfly Hick. And then if we move a bit more with the price up, we have high-flow versions of the Dragon hot ends, which we redesigned, then the very famous Rapido. Right. I think most people heard about the Rapido right on this market. Yeah, I have one of those at home. It prints very well. So uh, I, yes. I got to say that's one of my favorites as well. There is just sometimes more the feeling of I like the design. I like the footprint of that hot end, right? So you can see already that users have a preference towards design and color. And that's why we have so many kind of different hot ends. Well, on the topic of color, are you considering making additional colors for your hot ends? Because I know some people would really love that. We do have some concept ideas about adding new colors. So if, if we had to pick one color, I want everyone in the comments okay. to comment, what's your favorite color if you could pick a new uh, addition for the Rapido? Yeah, that's something we could do, right? Yeah. So if they uh, say specifically one color, we'll think about actually bringing that to market just with your comment. Okay, so uh, working our way down this way, it says yes. you've got some drop effect products. So those are yes. slightly different than your uh, Fetus products. Exactly. Yeah, so Drop Effect is a company in Germany where we do mostly R&D. When we merged with Fetus, we also wanted to design our own hot end. So we came up with the XG hot end. It had this proprietary nozzle design. It has this M4 thread and the nozzle goes all the way up through the heater up until to the heat break. The filament melts inside the nozzle instead of part of the heat break. And then users said like, yeah, I'm not interested in such a hot end if it has proprietary nozzle and is low flow. So we thought, okay, how can we make such a system, a high flow system yet have V6 nozzles? So we came up with the Next G hot end. So the Next G hot end, even though they look quite similar, but the internal geometry completely changed. We use now a bimetallic heat break, a V6 nozzle, and this section right there up into that net is already your heating area. And if you want even more flow rate, right, <laughs> we have then these adapters. And then your whole heating area becomes insanely long. Like the comparison of your heating area right there to your cooling section right. is insane. That's something also what we aim for, having a smaller section being responsible for the cooling and more of the section of the hot end being responsible for melting the filament. Right, because when you think about it, how big should each of those components be? Yes. It's an optimization problem. Ideally, you just have heating, right? Yeah. So it's like ambient temperature and then suddenly your hot end starts. So you would ideally like to plug in your heater directly to your hot end, but we do need cooling, right? We can't get away with that. The last build that I did, um, I put together a Rat Rig V-Minion build. So I had an old Rapido, I, I pulled it off another printer and stuck it on there. It's just fun to be doing all that tinkering and modding. Exactly, and it feels like more your 3D printer, right? And we hopefully give as much variety as possible so they can make their unique combination. And what I like about Fetus is it all looks nice, but it also has the performance to back it up. That's one of the big criteria Criteria. Obviously, it's nice to have something look good or have colors with it and stuff like that, but in the end, it has to work, right? We invest a lot of time in research, not only how to melt filament, but how do we manufacture that? Each product needs a different QC as well. So that's also part of the designing process. All right, so uh, we're over at this other table to take a look at some of your other products, including one that I'm sure everybody's excited about, and that is in this box. Yes, the Rapido 2. With ceramic heaters and circular ceramic heaters, it's a very difficult process. They are not easy to QC. I could imagine like, you know, you, you start the heater up and yeah, it works now, but after a couple hundred or thousand cycles, will it fail? Not really. You can very early on determine if a ceramic heater or circular ceramic heater will last you a very long time or not. We have two uh, materials that have different thermal expansions and if they're not assembled like exactly correctly, then there is constantly a small little pressure being pushed on it. And at some point, anything can crack, right? And then when they're cracked, you get your basically your issues. And we 
do that through a QC process early on to determine if something like this can happen. So they go through different cycles of heating. And the problem is if some of those heaters break, they're glued on. So we need to replace really the hot block as a whole unit. Expensive for us, expensive for potentially the users if they're out of warranty on that product. So we wanted to change that, make it more cost effective for the users, cost effective for us, for everybody and make things easier. So that's where then the Rapido 2 comes in. So we made changes to the thermistor or the temperature sensor because the thermistor is can also be a PT1000 and the heating element. So now we have a rectangular heating element so that makes it possible to remove that clip and then replace it in case something goes wrong and it has none of these issues with the expansion and contraction constantly. Also the thermistor or temperature sensor can be screwed on right and can be replaced more easily. Before that you need to disassemble the whole unit to remove those screws and everything to get even to that temperature sensor and with this option you can easily as a user basically replace all those parts in and in something goes wrong and obviously if it's on the warranty we'll replace those parts okay. for you. And what kind of nozzles does that uh, hot end use? Standard V6 nozzles. The UHF version comes then again with this adapter, creating a longer melt zone if you need that additional uh, heating. And over here we've got a special hot end for the Positron. That's one of the hot new printers that it like prints upside down. It's got a glass plate. So if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend looking it up. But you've designed a special hot end just for that printer, it looks like. Kralin, who designed that 3D printer, had a process to create a hot end where he drilled basically a hole from the side and from the top. So you had a, a 90 degree bend. It did work, no question about that. He made it possible, but we thought, let's give it a go like with our manufacturing possibilities to improve upon this design, you know, and make for that 3D printer a special hot end. So you have then this 90 degree angle and we wanted to have like a small gradual bend there instead of this actual like 90 degree bend because that's a bit radical and you would always want any kind of flow to be gradual. Sounds easy to say, How but to machine manufacture. machine that curve into a, inside yes, of a block? Yes, so. that's very difficult. So what we do is we use MIM technology. For those of you at home, if you're not familiar with metal injection molding, basically you're, you're injection molding a plastic that's filled with a bunch of little particles of metal, and then you burn it out and create a solid metal part, and it just shrinks down and densifies. I think one of the common applications of this is on iPhone connector cables, the little connector at the end. It's got really tiny features and they need to mass produce it, so they use metal injection molding. It's a quite complicated process, but it makes odd shapes very much possible in metal, which is awesome. It can bring the unit price down on, uh, on parts quite a bit, can't it? Yes, if you do it on a very, very large scale, you do. But like on the smaller quantities we are currently now, it's quite expensive to make. But, you know, at Faders, at Drop Effect, we do like this kind of challenges. So, yes, cost is always an issue and we always have to look even, like, you know, on the econo um, economy side. But at the same time, we want to push ourselves in the engineering side. So the challenge of showing that what we can do, I think, is a lot more important than just simply uh, looking only at cost and cost effectiveness. And that was a challenge, right? 90 right. degree Can bend. I take a look at this? Yeah, it, that, that's just insane. So the surface finish on this is very different than your other products, but it still looks that, right? good. It looks really cool, right? It looks so also kind of futuristic in a, in a sense. We do have the Apis extruder and basically that extruder was designed where we said we want to have like this all metal extruder that is adaptable to most hot ends on the market. It has some cool features. It uses a NEMA 14 stepper motor. It has a manual wheel to load and unload your filament. It has easy filament access on the side here. So you remove that little spring and then you can basically access your whole filament path. And we have that little plastic adapter for your hot ends right there. Technically, you can also download that file from the website adapt it, change it to your specific hot end. We've also got some filament samples back here. So what are all of these? You've got some weights hanging there. Yeah, so we have now our own filaments. Obviously, when we do like the testing, there is the issue of creep. So right. what we did for six months, these samples were loaded with one kilogram of weight and then just left there. And then we looked at how much creep is in the material over that time. We tried to is, uh, change our formulas of the base polymer and the carbon fiber content in such a way that the creep 
is minimized over longer periods of time. I think one of the biggest barriers to using uh, plastic 3D printing in a lot of applications is that creep. Let's say you tighten something down and then over time it squishes a little bit and then the bolts come loose and it falls apart. So yes. you don't want to be making low quality products yes. and a big part of that is making sure you don't have creep. Yes, but it's also like quite important to know that sometimes your creep happens due to how you print your part and how your slicer settings are, right? So if your density is not correct, if you leave a big surface area that has a low infillant, for instance, that can all introduce creep. So we hope with our filament that you have a better reliability with your parts, right? So that you can get away even with, let's say, less optimal slicer settings. And uh, I actually got some of that carbon fiber filament a while ago, and I, I did some tensile testing with a, a really jerry-rigged uh, universal test machine I set up in my basement, and it broke it. It broke my machine. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I was able to break a bunch of PLA samples. I broke some of your competitors, carbon yeah. fiber nylon. And then I got to this stuff and it, it just completely stripped out the motor. So it was uh, at two and a half times the strength of PLA before my, uh, my test rig failed. So I don't know the ultimate strength, but do you have any indications of what that might be? Um, yeah, I would need to look up the data sheet okay. again. You know, we have loads of different combinations of carbon fiber and glass fiber material combinations. And we have now also developed new approaches of carbon fiber and glass-filled fiber filaments. And one of the nice things about these, uh, these filaments is that I received like a big data sheet with all yes. of the material properties, yes. so you know what you're working with. Yes, we do have data sheets on all our materials, so you can look them up and find the right material for your specific application. Right. So obviously you want a high fiber content, right? right? So that is the main goal. As you increase the carbon fiber content, you get more and more brittle material. So we tried to find a way again to get to that 15% that everybody can print but with 25%. And that I think segues us over to your next product that I was looking at earlier. This is a very interesting looking spool you have here. Yes, um, I'm very excited about that. As we mentioned before, you want to increase your fiber content but as you increase your fiber content you get more and more brittle material and it literally easily snaps. So it's very difficult to print, to feed and so on. So what you can do now is say, listen, we're gonna build a jacket around. So you use your base material, let's say ABS, and then you add fiber content in that. So then you print or extrude a very thin strand. Let's put that number at, let's say one millimeter. And then to get to the 1.75, you coat that with pure ABS. And that gives the outside shell the pliability of ABS, yet gives the fiber content on the inside the rigidity what you're looking for, but also your layer adhesion is significantly improved. So that's the, the main feature on that new kind of filament. And it has a higher fiber content and you can feed it more easily. Right, now instead of the extruder teeth pushing on carbon fiber, they're pushing on uh, pure ABS. Exactly. Which is it, also gonna reduce wear issues. It reduces wear kind of everywhere a bit, like on your nozzle or your drive gear system. But you have to still remember you're, you're extruding carbon fibers, right. right? So please don't use still brass nozzles and think I can get away with that. Still use your hardened nozzles um, because that material still will wear over time, but it will significantly reduce that wear. Yeah, I gotta say this is a very clever solution. So normally when you print a part and you want it to be stiff, you'll just do kind of like an outer shell in like steel tubes, you know, they're, they just have the outer layer that carries all the stress. But with this, you're taking your stiff material and putting it all the way in the middle and then putting a more flexible material on the outside. Yep. So uh, how much is this filament? I mean, I gotta ask. Price point, we'll have to see. This new technology offers a lot of possibilities, right? Yeah. With the coating and everything, you could think of multiple kind of, does it need to be ABS, ABS? Right. Or could it be nylon, something nylon, nylon? Or, or, or TPU and some other thing? Okay. There's, there's a million possibilities yeah, here and it's really cool. Yeah, so we, so that's a start, right? But we're gonna push hopefully that, uh, that coating technology even further. All right, very cool. The whole extrusion process involves also having nozzles and nozzles obviously have their purposes, right? So um, we have our brass nozzles because they're cost effective. Nickel plated copper nozzles, therefore, having better thermal conductivity. Hardened steel has great wear resistance. However, downside of them is that they have a low thermal conductivity. DLC hardened and coated steel um, nozzles are, for instance, when you print a lot of fibers and, you know, PETGs, for instance, they like to stick to nozzles. Yeah. That coating helps that the, that the filament doesn't stick too much to the, to the nozzle and keeps the nozzle a bit cleaner over time. Stainless steel nozzles are here for your 
technically for your food safe option. So anything when you do want to print something food safe, technically you have to use stainless steel. Yes, there are going to be comments that uh, 3D printing is technically not food safe because of the gaps. I do understand that. Well, single use items will probably be okay. Yeah, exactly. One of the really cool, but like a bit more expensive options are tungsten carbide nozzles. So what we do is we have a, a copper core that is then DLC coated and the tip is solely um, your tungsten carbide. Okay, right? I had one of those in for review and I had a million different comments saying how it was built and it's made out of this material and that material. So it's a tungsten carbide core with a copper jacket and DLC coating. Yes, and uh, we're actually quite proud. We even improved upon the process now. So these were, let's say, version one. We have a version two coming soon where the tip is inserted differently. Beta testers on that nozzle was uh, okay, that nozzle is my end old nozzle. I will never need another nozzle in my life because the, the tungsten carbide tip is so sharp at the edge, at the outlet. So when you then finish your extrusion and then do your travel move and do your retract, it cuts it off kind of like a knife. The, it's like the a little material. pair of scissors there. Yeah, exactly. Then like, go away and then cut it off, right? Yeah. Um, so that is a really major advantage on these nozzles, but they're a bit more expensive than, let's say, a brass nozzle, then a bit more expensive than the copper nickel plated. I mean, the more engineering and different uh, exotic materials you put into a product, that inherently drives up the price, but yes. it's worth it for certain applications. Exactly, it's worth for certain applications, and we just want to offer that option. It's not a nozzle that everybody in this, uh, in this industry will need, but if you want to like, you know, make incremental improvements on, on your extrusion process and your 3D prints, that might be an option to look at. Well, thanks so much, Max, for having me over at the Thank Fetus you, booth. It's great to see all this amazing innovation and technology uh, that's accessible to us as our hobby 3D printers. Yeah, and there was, will be more to come, right? So yeah. we're, we're still working on a lot of stuff. Sounds like he's got a lot of stuff he can't tell me about. Yeah, right there now, is so. stuff like, I wish I could tell you so about certain we'll... things about, like, but <laughs> we're working on it. And well, you just have to be patient with me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do a follow-up interview.